Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has taken his diplomatic campaign against Russia's war on Ukraine to the United Nations Security Council in an emergency session called to discuss the killings of Ukrainian civilians in the town of Bucha near the capital. Zelensky accused Russian troops of war crimes. He also demanded a reform of the Security Council to remove Russia's veto power. Here's the Ukrainian president. So where is the security that the Security Council needs to guarantee? It's not there, although there is a Security Council. Uh, and, uh, uh, so where is the peace? Where, where, where are those guarantees that the United Nations needs to guarantee? It is obvious that the key institution of the world, which must ensure uh, the coercion of any aggressor to peace, simply cannot work effectively. Now, the the world can see that the Russian, what Russian military did in Bucha while keeping the city under their occupation. But the world has yet to see what they have done in other occupied cities and regions of our country. Geography might be different or various, but cruelty is the same, crimes are the same, and accountability must be inevitable. Let's bring in Katerina Busol. She's a lawyer from Ukraine, special specializing in international humanitarian and criminal law. Ms. Busal, thank you for taking the time to speak to DW. Now, President Zelensky says what we're seeing in Bucha are war crimes, genocide. Russia says it's all fake. How does international law see it? Uh, there is strong evidence to believe that war crimes have been perpetrated in Bucha and uh, um, allegedly in other areas. Uh, there's also a possibility to claim the perpetration of the crimes against humanity, which is a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. And indeed, there have been the discussions about the possible genocidal intent, uh, which is a high threshold to prove under international law, because there should be an intention to destroy in whole or in part one of the four groups, and one of the four groups could be a national group. And given certain statements by Russia's uh, top uh, leadership, uh, one could derive, or at least like one could start thinking about such intention. And of course, in law, the presumption of innocence and in criminal law is, is paramount, but um, certain images are deeply disturbing in terms of, you know, the civilians seen uh, with burned bodies and tied hands and shot from behind. So there is a, you know, the strong evidence for uh, possible arrest warrants, either internationally by the International Criminal Court, because it launched an investigation into the situation in March. Uh, in Ukraine, because Ukraine con has been conducting conflict-related proceedings since 2014, mm -hmm. and also in a number of foreign jurisdictions, national foreign jurisdiction, and the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine has reported so far that nine countries have opened investigations into alleged conflict-related violations in Ukraine, including Germany, the Baltic states, Poland, Sweden, France, and some others. Now, you've been documenting sexual violence in Russia's war in Ukraine since Crimea was annexed, and people have been telling you about the horrific acts of violence committed against them in recent weeks. So aside from the images that we're seeing, you're hearing personal accounts. What have they been telling you? Um, I must specify that I worked with survivors who have suffered from uh, rapes and other forms of sexual violence perpetrated by the Russia-controlled armed groups since 2014, but before February. It was my direct experience. And there were uh, cases of rapes, sexualized torture, uh, and other forms of sexual violence in places of unlawful detention in the self-proclaimed so-called uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People Republics. There have been accounts of sexual violence uh, in the occupied territories. And of course, we are getting to the new threshold of violence now as the cases from the currently temporarily occupied territories emerge. And we heard that there is at least one notice of suspicion uh, concerning the female survivor from the northern areas of the Kyiv region who was uh, raped uh, after her husband was killed by 
to uh, Russian service people. There are increasingly more reports from northern eastern areas of Ukraine and from southern areas of Ukraine where uh, the Russian troops have been stationed or are still there. Now, rape is often underreported, as we know, and certainly more so in conflict zones. How difficult is it to gather these accounts, this evidence, and document these war crimes? Uh, sexual violence and conflict is one of the types of, of the alleged war crimes or crimes against humanity which are notoriously hard to document. First, there, of course, should be an incentive for the survivors and the witnesses to come up and speak, and they should feel safe about it. Um, uh, certain organizations, including La Strada, have reported that they received the calls from survivors, but the the the, the um, access to you know to providing actual help to them is of course impeded by the fact that they are in the occupied territories. Um, it's very important that uh, Ukraine has a specialized approach to these victims, and Ukraine has been developing a specialized investigative strategy which would be sensitive to, not to re-traumatize these particular survivors. And Ukraine has also been developing the specific reparation uh, program for these types of victims. But I should stress that while um, domestically Ukraine has been dealing with conflict-related crimes, including sexual violence, since 2014, the prosecutors, the investigators involved in such cases, they were based you know, in Kyiv and largely in eastern areas. So all other um, uh, investigators and prosecutors around the country, they did not really face these cases because they were not of such a large scale. So now it's also important to ensure that this professional development and the sensitization of Ukraine's investigators, prosecutors and judges who deal with conflict-connected crimes, especially sexual violence, that their professionalization is ensured so that, that when they conduct the proceedings, they don't re-traumatize mm. the survivors and they, well, they also help them and their wider families. Um, I think we see the indications that this is understood. The prosecutor general has sought um, specific um, advice from her current um, uh, advisory group from Britain and the United States concerning rape and other forms of sexual violence. So I'm hoping that this recognition, that the specialized approach is needed for this particular type of violence and for these particular survivors, that it's there and that we will see the more sensitized approach to these cases in Ukraine. Katerina Busol, Ukrainian lawyer with Chatham House, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you for having me. Russia denies accusations that its troops committed war crimes in Bucha. A Kremlin spokesperson insists the allegation were a, quote, monstrous forgery aimed at denigrating the Russian army. But mounting evidence contradicts Russia's claims that the killings occurred after its forces withdrew from the town. The New York Times has published satellite images which show a street in Bucha. This first image is from February 28th, before Russian troops could control of the town. The second image now is from mid-March, when the Russian military occupied Bucha. This outlines the bodies of civilians, which have been there for weeks. Our next guest is Malaki Brown. He's with the New York Times Visual Investigations team. Malaki, thank you for taking the time to speak to DW. Now, walk us through the process of verification. How did your team reach this conclusion that the bodies had actually been there for three weeks while Russia was still in control of the town? Yes, uh, thanks. It began with those images that emerged uh, at the weekend after what Russia had withdrawn and Ukrainian officials and journalists could finally get in and document what was left behind. Um, we started by uh, confirming the location of those uh, videos and pictures um, and really just mapping out where victims were found. Of course, many were found in basements and homes, under trees and whatnot. Uh, but we, we focused on the open areas <clears throat> because, as you say, Russia was very quick not to launch an investigation into these, um, this evidence, but to de refute that um, or to deny that its military had anything to do with it. Um, and really what it was, it was quite a simple exercise of going back through um, archival satellite imagery through the month of March 
um, to see if we could spot those bodies appearing on the street um, prior to March 30th, which was the Russian claim uh, of, of when these bodies um, appeared after they had withdrawn. And that's what we found, that from um, the, the earliest satellite image we had on March 9th, uh, you could see those bodies in those positions along about a half a mile of one thoroughfare in Bucha. Now, use publicly available data. In this instance, there were satellite images. In other instances, it's images off social media. What are some of the steps that you use to verify footage that's been posted on Twitter or on Facebook? Um, well, it, it's it's who, where, what. It's the, it's, um, uh, it's the basic journalistic questions. Can we identify exactly where this picture or video was taken? when it was taken through weather reports, metadata, which is like file information that's embedded within the in the videos, uh, corroborating it with other um, information that we're getting from the town. We had photographers and reporters in Bucha over the last few days as well, who spoke to witnesses. Um, and the visual evidence in this case just serves to support what witnesses have told us in Bucha and in other uh, parts of Ukraine where Russian forces have with, uh, uh, withdrawn from. Um, today, we're just about to publish actually new video from that same intersection in uh, Bucha that shows um, a convoy of 20 or more Russian military vehicles in that position where we found more than a dozen bodies. So we know now that they were situated there and we also see them firing heavy caliber rounds at a cyclist who turns a corner um, at that intersection. It was one of the more graphic bodies that we uh, declined to show yesterday, but we're showing it today because that body is found again at the exact position which the Russians fire on the person um, in early March. So aside from the satellite images, you now have video of Russian troops firing on civilians on that very same stretch of area. Correct. So when Russia says all of this happened after their troops pulled out, in your mind, given the evidence that you've collected and verified, they're lying. It's conclusive evidence that their military was there, was active and was firing at people on the street where those bodies were found weeks later. Malaki Brown with the New York Times Visual Investigations team. Thank you very much. Thanks. While Russian forces have left the Kyiv region, Moscow is mounting new attacks in the east. Russia has said its focus is now on taking control of the Donbass region and key eastern cities like Kramatorsk. Ukrainian officials warn that Moscow is trying to encircle its forces in the area and say they expect heavy fighting ahead. Trying to reach safety ahead of the expected Russian offensive. Here in Kramatorsk, in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region, residents are waiting on packed roads and squeezing onto full trains. Ukrainian officials are expecting fierce fighting here in the days ahead, as Russian forces focus on the east after being pushed back elsewhere. Even those who have chosen to remain, like this volunteer helping people at Kramatorsk train station, are worried about what lies ahead. The latest rumors that we hear, they are from official sources, are that Russia is moving its troops to the east and we will be surrounded. It could turn into a second Mariupol here. Kramatorsk has already come under increased Russian shelling in recent days after being largely spared the destruction seen in other eastern cities like Kharkiv to the northwest. Ukraine's second largest city has been under relentless bombardment for weeks. Residents are bracing for a renewed Russian offensive. The main focus of the enemy is to prepare for the resumption of offensive operations to surround Ukrainian troops and capture the city of Kharkiv. While Russia's efforts to take the city have made little progress since their invasion began, it remains to be seen whether Kharkiv's defenders can hold on as Moscow brings even more force to bear. For further analysis, let's bring in Katya Gloga. She's an author and a former correspondent in both Moscow and Washington. Her specialty is Russian affairs and international security policy. Thank you for being with us. Now, what Putin wants, Ukraine is unwilling to give. Is there anything in this moment that might force the Russian president to turn his troops around to stop this war? 
Nothing, Abby, that we can see at this point uh, in time, certainly and clearly, this war um, planned or imagined by Putin and his people does not go as planned. Uh, he believed, you know, in a blitzkrieg um, three days and then a victory parade in Kiev and later on maybe in Moscow on the Red Square. Um, this is not uh, happening as we see now, but he cannot lose this war. So at some point he has to declare victory and many experts think that on May 9th, the symbolic day of victory uh, in the Second World War, the most holy uh, holiday in Russia that he needs to declare victory. And this victory could be the so-called final liberation of Donbass and maybe of parts of southern Ukraine from the imagined so-called uh, Nazists in Ukraine. So we have been hearing consistently over the last several weeks from Russia experts saying that Putin needs an exit ramp. He needs to be able to sell this as a victory to the Russian people, as you just said. And you're saying now that that is likely to come at the beginning of May. How could he potentially sell this as a victory, given that this is none of this is going according to plan? Um, because we've seen a shift in the narrative, in the official narrative um, within the last 10 days roundabout. And this shift uh, now concentrates on the eastern parts of Ukraine, the liberation of the so-called People's Republics, the separatist areas in eastern Ukraine. Um, and you also see it on the military side, the regroupment of forces, um, the um, more and more attacks in the east and also in the south. I fear within the next weeks, um, there is still a month to go until May 9th, uh, the worst uh, maybe even yet to come. Um, and then for him to declare victory um, for at least um, the eastern part of Ukraine. Let's talk a little bit about sanctions. Germany and other Western countries have announced further sanctions after the atrocities, the images that we've seen coming out of Bucha. Is this possible oil embargo going to be enough, do you think? Um, at least it's a start. Um, the, especially the German government has been very reluctant when it comes to calls uh, from Ukraine to speed up and finally impose a full-scale energy import um, embargo um, on Russia. There's certainly um, political considerations um, and the fear that uh, these kind of um, embargo, full-scale embargo, would have catastrophic consequences for the German industry, for the German economy, and maybe um, for German society. Um, so now they try to gain time every day um, is a win in this sense um, to um, to 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 pursue a strategy, a tactic um, to reduce dependency on these imports. And they are getting there, but it's, um, as we can see, it's way too slow. Now they start within the EU with, a, with an embargo on coal imports. This is more or less easy um, to impose. Oil is the second part of it, um, but the biggest chunk um, in an embargo on gas imports, um, they are still very reluctant um, to take this on. And uh, especially Germany is very reluctant. And I think they uh, would need to rethink it, especially also after the pictures we've been seeing and the uh, the mounting evidence of war crimes uh, by the Russian army in all these places in the north of Kiev and in many other places of Ukraine, too. As you say, the German government here has repeatedly said that a full gas embargo would hurt Germany as well. But talk to us about how much it will hurt Vladimir Putin. 
The unity on sanctions um, imposed by the West, financial sanctions, um, export controls, uh, going also after the oligarchs and their offshore accounts, this hurts the Russian economy and it hurts a lot and it hurts quickly. Um, but still, um, the Russian system, Putin's system and Putin's business mod model, so to say, uh, depends on the export um, of fossil of fossil resources, of gas uh, in the very first place. So um, imposing an embargo on gas imports uh, for Germany or even for the European Union would hurt quickly and a lot. Would it stop the war within the next couple of weeks? No, uh, it wouldn't. But it would uh, weaken Putin's position a lot and maybe force him to um, a negotiation table um, sooner than later. But this is, you know, this is optimism and uh, maybe an illusion, but um, at least we have to try. Before I let you go, we have a little bit of time left. How do you see this war unfolding in the next several weeks, in the next several months, in the next several years? I think we need to do everything now to give Ukraine as much leverage as possible, speed up with uh, arms deliveries, um, discuss tougher sanctions on Russia, um, try to get to a ceasefire at least, and maybe move from there to peace negotiation. It's a very, very, very long road uh, to go, especially after Bucha. Bucha has become a symbol for Russian atrocities in Ukraine, um, less and less people in Ukraine are willing to negotiate a so-called dirty peace with Putin. So it will be a long period, maybe years of instability and a dangerous time we are all entering. Katya Gloga, the author of Putin's World, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Thank you very much.